So it's a couple minutes after um, the, the hour here, so we're, we're going to get started. Before I introduce Dr. Meg Astapa, I just want to welcome you again to the Darling Marine Center Summer Science Seminar Series. This is the second of three virtual seminars that we're doing at the Darling Marine Center in Walpole, Maine this summer. And as part of the University of Maine, we are delighted to have the opportunity to host research and education and business incubation activities and community engagement activities for individuals who are working in the Midcoast region and across the state. Today, we have Dr. Meg Estapa, who is beginning a faculty position at the University of Maine School of Marine Sciences and based at the Darling Marine Center. She begins her appointment uh, on August 1st, just, just the week after next. And uh, most recently, she was on the faculty at Skidmore College, and we're really, really delighted to have Meg with us today to share her research, and um, I'll turn it over to Meg. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction, Heather. Um, I am going to share title screen here. All right, everybody see that okay? Yes. Heather? Yes, okay, cool. Um, so uh, I'm gonna be spending most of uh, the talk today um, talking about um, what we like to call the biological carbon pump, which is um, the way that ocean biology, right? So ecosystems and organisms in the ocean are trans responsible for the transfer of uh, carbon, uh, starting off as carbon dioxide into the deep sea. Um, and this is, this is interesting for a lot of reasons. I'm gonna start by giving just some background on the biological carbon pump and its connections to global climate and, um, and sort of why we are thinking about it maybe in, the term, in terms of uh, climate change right now. And then in the latter part of the talk, I'm gonna show some, uh, some data and talk about methods that we use in our oceanographic field work to actually measure the processes that contribute to the biological carbon pump. Um, so I, I see in the attendees list that there are uh, a bunch of neighbors and friends of the Darling Center and then also some scientists. So um, at some point, uh, we're going to start off basically with the, the overview, sort of getting everybody up to speed so we're all on the same page and then we'll move into data after that. Okay. Um, let's see. So the figure that I'm showing here is uh, taken from a recent compilation of data. Um, about the anthropogenic or human uh, emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, this, uh, this figure starts uh, in the year 1900. And I see that there is one digit chopped off at the beginning of the horizontal axis. So that should be the year 1900 going up almost through the present. And what it's tracking um, is the amount of CO2 or carbon dioxide released into the Earth system through human activities. Um, so the, the yellow shaded area shows the amount per year released through land use change. So these are, are ways that humans are changing uh, the use of land and that's transferring some carbon from, uh, from some stored pools into the Earth system. And then the other um, larger, currently larger and increasing source of, uh, of emissions is fossil fuels and industry. So this is, is burning of uh, hydrocarbon fuels and, uh, and cement production and things like that contribute to most of it. And these data come from human records of our own activity. So that's, that's we know pretty well what our emissions are looking like there. Um, and just if you're not used to thinking about um, carbon dioxide or gas in terms of grams, right, of mass, um, just a petagram is roughly the weight of 88 million school buses. Um, just to put that in terms of something that we've all seen, maybe not recently, but hopefully will in a, a year or two again. Um, so, so it's a pretty large amount. Um, so now what I've done is I've added a, the bottom half of this figure, which is a, the mirror image of the top half, right? And what we're looking at is uh, where those anthropogenic CO2 emissions are estimated to have gone in the Earth system. So, um, the, the two curves should roughly look like mirror images. The pink line um, actually is showing, on the pink line on the bottom half of the plot, is showing the, exactly the mirror image of the emissions. And the blue and green, two shades of green areas, are showing how much of the human emitted CO2 is estimated to have gone into these different sections of Earth's system, right? So, 
Um, the darker green kind of teal green color is the amount over time that's been estimated to go into the ocean. The lime green, the lighter green center section is showing the amount that's been estimated to go into land. So into the terrestrial biosphere, soils, things like that. And then the remaining uh, light blue is showing how much has gone into the atmosphere. And we can measure that fairly accurately. We have good atmospheric measurements. Um, but partitioning the CO2 uptake into the land and ocean uh, parts of the Earth system has, uh, requires modeling, right? It requires sort of knitting together our best scientific understanding of how these processes work. Um, so since uh, the 1750s, you know, since we started burning a lot of fossil fuels, uh, the ocean has absorbed about 25%, um, around 155 petagrams, and remember each petagram is 88 million school buses, of our CO2 emissions. Okay, that's, that's mostly a good thing, right? It's keeping it out of the atmosphere, so that is decreasing the effects of uh, atmospheric CO2 on the climate. Of course, there are lots of knock-on effects about having all that CO2 in the ocean. But regardless, we think the ocean has been a pretty big contributor to um, absorbing our emissions over time. So our questions then are, one, how has the ocean been able to absorb this much CO2 so far? Um, and two, and maybe this is the more compelling one uh, that will drive uh, this talk in its latter parts, is will it continue to absorb CO2 at the same rate in the future as we go forward? Um, so how did 155 petagrams of CO2 get into the ocean? Well, the main reason actually is, is a, a physical one, right? It was mixed in and dissolved. So gases can dissolve in water. If you think about a bottle of soda or something like that, it's got fizzy bubbles in it, right? And dissolved carbon dioxide in it. Um, and this is really effective if you're dissolving CO2 into cold water that's then going on to sink deeper where it can't mix back and forth with the atmosphere anymore. Um, so that happens in places like the North Atlantic Ocean. So this is the number one reason. However, I'll get into why we think this other reason is also important to keep track of. Uh, the second reason that the ocean is taking up CO2 is that um, ocean biology actually does this. Um, it, takes the, so that CO2 dissolves in the water and uh, phytoplankton, which are single celled organisms, they're primary producers. So they are the base of the marine food web um, in the open ocean. So they absorb the CO2 and through photosynthesis, they make themselves, right? They make their own bodies. They make energy that gets burned by other organisms later on in the food web. Um, and so uh, if you don't remember, photosynthesis is just combining carbon dioxide and water. Uh, with energy input from the sun to produce um, with other inputs as well, all the important molecules that make up living things. Um, so this image here is uh, probably similar to ones you might have seen before. It's a satellite image of the ocean highlighting the filaments and tendrils and eddies uh, and the green color of primary producers of phytoplankton in the ocean. If you are um, listening to this seminar, you probably have an interest in ocean, the oceans, and you've probably seen something like this before, maybe even of the Gulf of Maine. So this is just um, one particularly high resolution image illustrating this. If we zoom way in close, those green filaments in the satellite image are actually composed of many, many, many tiny microscopic cells that are actually the phytoplankton. These are these primary producers. Um, so the, the images I'm showing you here are all collected under the microscope. The two on the left are actually showing bigger cells than the ones on the right, but they're all things that you can't really see very well with your naked eye. So tiny organisms actually really important for taking up CO2 in the ocean. This, uh, this artwork is illustrating um, some of what I've already been telling you, and it's then looping it into the whole biological part of the carbon cycle in the ocean. So we've just talked about phytoplankton, which are drawn up here at the top. Um, I'm circling my mouse. I'm not sure if you can see it, but we're, we're looking at the, um, the spirals and chains and thing that looks like a Klingon battleship that's actually a dinoflagellate um, up at the surface here. Those are the photosynthetic organisms taking CO2 up and producing themselves. These of course get consumed in turn by um, organisms that are not photosynthetic, but 
need to eat other things to get their energy. So those include zooplankton, uh, like this copepod here, um, larger things like fish, and uh, even um, bacteria, right? So once organisms start to excrete their wastes, uh, then bacteria get into that. And so um, there's all different types of organisms, all different types of scales that are consuming this material fixed by the phytoplankton. Um, and then finally, those bacteria also remineralize or take organic matter, take the carbon that's fixed into the tissues of living things and convert that back into dissolved chemicals that can then be used to support the production all over again. Um, so this is, is what's thought of as the biological carbon cycle in the upper ocean. Um, and it looks like a closed loop if you look at it. Um, it's important to mention here, not that there's any reason to expect that photosynthesis in the ocean would stop on a dime, but if it did, then atmospheric carbon dioxide would increase by around 200 parts per million. And for comparison, that is a lot more than what we humans have done. And we've learned a lot about that um, in the surface ocean or in the atmosphere rather. Um, so, so it is really important for maintaining our, our carbon cycle at present. Um, so this, this artwork looks like a closed loop. And for the most part, it is. The CO2 that gets taken up and incorporated into marine food webs gets converted right back into CO2 again at the end of the cycle. However, small amounts of the, the tissues and the material that gets produced by living things actually leaks. So the cycle is not a closed cycle. It's like a, it's got a slow leak, right? And so over really long time scales, decades to millennia, ocean biology is actually slowly removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and it's putting it into the deep waters of the ocean or the sediments at the seafloor. And so this is Earth's long-term way of pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere um, and into the ocean. Um, and this, this process actually over billions of years is thought to be responsible for why we have oxygen left over in the atmosphere to breathe. Um, that's just a little aside. Okay, so ocean biology, or what we call the biological carbon pump, is really important um, for this long-term cycling of carbon dioxide. And if it were to change drastically in the near future, we might also see an effect in the carbon cycling. Um, so I'm gonna demonstrate, or try and illustrate a little bit, uh, the processes that, that make up this leakage, this transfer of carbon out of this closed cycle and into the deep water. And I'm gonna draw this on a, a little cartoon of the ocean. And I will say right, in, right now, I've divided it into the upper sunlit part and the deeper, darker waters below. And it's really not to scale. Um, the, the actual sunlit part of the ocean is a thin skin on top of a really large, dark interior. But I've drawn it this way because it makes it easier for the cartoon. So um, just keep that in mind. This is actually, everything in the light box is squished up to the top. Okay, so this is a, a real oversimplification of what I've just talked about, right? This cycle, this looping of carbon uptake by primary producers through the food web, remineralization back to CO2. Um, but this leakage can occur in a number of ways. One is the phytoplankton cells themselves occasionally might die and sink out of the surface water without getting eaten by something. So, you know, like leaves falling from the trees in autumn if you're not uh, if you're more of a, a terrestrially or a land focused person. Um, zooplankton, uh, not really bacteria in this box, but the zooplankton uh, excrete waste products, right? Everybody does it. Um, and so those particles of waste also sink into deep water. And then all this leakage, this stuff, these particles sinking out of the water, um, sometimes will stick together kind of like the dust bunnies under your bed. If your bed is like my bed and you don't sweep under it very often, um, you might see aggregates of this material in the ocean. Those form, they get big, and then they sink. Um, there are also some zooplankton that, uh, in order to escape their predators, they go down and hang out in deep water, in darker waters during the daytime. And so those zooplankton might be eating up at the surface at night, and then they go down and they digest their food during the day and release CO2 while they respire and do that. So that's another way that we transfer, biologically transfer CO2 from the surface waters into the deep waters. And then finally, the water itself can advect or mix, and that can transfer 
um, particles of carbon or dissolved carbon that maybe wouldn't sink by themselves, but the water moves and so then they get transferred as well. So altogether, we have these five processes. And this is just one way of thinking about it, right, of categorizing these processes. But overall, what, um, what it should convey to you is that the biological carbon pump is complex. It depends on ecological interactions and uh, prevalence of different species that might vary from place to place and season to season. And so it's really hard to predict how it might change in the future unless we know what are the important operative processes in different parts of the ocean. And overall, again, it's resulting in a net transfer of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the deep ocean. Um, so our question then that's gonna drive the work that I'm gonna talk about to you in the second part of the talk is, will the ocean continue to absorb carbon dioxide as it has been for the last century and a half in the future. Um, so traditional tools haven't yet given us the ability to predict how this biological carbon pump might change if things that are changing already in the ocean that we, we observe changing, uh, such as the temperature rising, the pH dropping, right, the ocean becoming more acidic, uh, sea ice cover decreasing, allowing more light to penetrate. All these things are going to tweak the balance of ocean ecosystems potentially and might have effects on the biological carbon pump. Um, so if we want to be able to predict how this might change in the future, we, we can only measure things in the present and sort of in the past, depending on our data availability. Um, and so our approach here is to find out how the biological carbon pump, the system, functions in existing settings that it uh, exist in the the present ocean and that are contrasting, right? That are, are different in terms of their, um, their ecosystem structure or their productivity. So uh, the project that I'm involved in that's attempting to do this, to collect this data so that we can begin to make better predictions um, in the future is supported by NASA um, and it's, it's acronym. You can see how it breaks down. Acronyms are silly because you capitalize letters in the middle of words and things like that. But the acronym we're using is exports for the project. Um, and uh, it's supported by NASA. Um, it might be sort of odd to think at first, like why would NASA care about the bottom of the ocean or the dark interior of the ocean? But actually, um, hopefully in the next few years, uh, advances in ocean color satellites, these are satellites that take those pretty pictures of phytoplankton in the ocean surface are gonna get better um, and more sophisticated. So we can start to tell things about the ocean ecosystem and its status and who's involved um, from satellite images. So if we can use that information then to drive models and predictions of what's going on in the interior, that's a good thing. Um, so the field campaign sites, the places that we're going to see in collecting measurements through the exports program um, are in the North Pacific Ocean, which is the filled yellow dot, and the North Atlantic Ocean, which is the open yellow circle. Uh, we visited the North Pacific Ocean in 2018 to collect measurements um, and um, we'll hopefully be going to the North Atlantic Ocean in 2021. We were supposed to go this spring, but that got postponed for obvious reasons. Um, so the observational plan, the way that, that the exports projects participants are going about this is to try and characterize every single pathway, all of those different processes that make up my cartoon of the biological carbon pump um, simultaneously. So go and try and measure everything all at once so that we understand for our site, what are the most important processes? What are the things that are driving uh, the biological carbon pump there? Um, so to do this, we send two ships out to sea at the same time. Both are, are large oceanographic research vessels. Um, we put lots of sort of autonomous robotic sensors into the ocean at the same time. We collect satellite data. Um, and, and one thing that we're doing, um, and this is the part of the project that I'm involved in, is to put what are called sediment traps into the water. There's two types shown on the, the schematic here. Um, there is a sediment trap array that's attached to a drifting buoy. So we see the traps uh, going down into the water uh, through the upper 500 meters of the ocean. And then um, there's also sediment traps that are attached to robotic profiling floats. So these are floats that just drift around and find their own depth in the water. 
And the sediment traps themselves are like rain gauges that collect sinking particles and then they return them back to you on the ship so you can collect the particles and figure out how big they are and what they're made of and, um, and who produced them and things like that. Um, up close, here's a, an image of a neutrally buoyant sediment trap that's getting prepared to be deployed. Uh, this, is, um, this was on the RV Falcor, which is a research vessel operated by the Schmidt Ocean Institute. And this is um, me in the green plaid shirt and my close collaborator, Melissa Omond, in the pink jacket. And we're getting an NBST, um, or neutrally buoyant sediment trap, ready to go. So the center of it is just this profiling float. It's a float that can adjust its own density so it can go up and down in the water and hit the right depth for sampling. Um, and the sediment trap tube itself, I've put a label on here. It's got a lid on top, so the lid is closed right now while it's on the deck of the ship. Um, but when we deploy it, then that's opened up and the particles settle into this plastic cylinder, collect in the bottom. Um, we also put optical sensors to, um, to measure particle, um, particle flux, right, the amount that's sinking. I'm not going to get into that in the talk today, but uh, we, we use a number of different techniques to try and, and characterize the sinking particles. Um, and then finally, the NBST has what I'll say, quote, retrieval aids, right, yellow rope, um, GPS beacon, strobe light, lots of things that are there to help us get it back out of the water, which is sometimes... Um, makes your heart go pitter-patter a little bit. Um, and I will also say you can't tell from this photo, but we've been all up all night preparing uh, the sediment traps on for this, uh, for this deployment. And so both Melissa and I were like caffeinated out of our minds during that. Um, OK, so once the sediment trap is ready to go, you open up the lids. And hopefully you can see in the photo here the open tubes ready to go. And crane it off the side of the ship. And you let it go into the ocean. So this, this part is also a little bit like, ah, uh, but if it's programmed correctly, it sinks down, it finds its sampling depth, and then a few days later, it pops back up again, sends a GPS signal, and you go pick it up. So once an MBST is collected, and that's what I'm showing you here, this photo is from the RV Revell, which is another research vessel, and this was actually out in the Exports North Pacific Cruise. So this is me and um, all my collaborators from the Exports Project, and we're bringing the MBST back aboard here. Once uh, the float is back aboard, we take those sediment trap tubes off, hang them on the wall in the lab, and I will uh, admit here, this is actually a different ship again. This is the RRS Discovery, um, and uh, colleague Ken Bissler and uh, Jen Kenyon, his student. So we take these sediment trap tubes, rack them up, and the bottoms are now filled up with our particles that we're so interested in. Um, and we, we collect those, we analyze them for things like organic carbon and inorganic carbon or calcium carbonate content, nitrogen, silicon, isotopic compositions. There's uh, collaborators who are doing things like uh, lithogenic or land sourced uh, element analysis. There's people doing genetic work on these particles. So there's lots of things that happen um, with those particles. The other thing that we do is we put a container full of, and I'll explain the starburst wrapper here in a second. We, we put a container full of uh, gel. It's a transparent gel, it's kind of got the consistency of honey. And the particles sink into the sediment trap and they just get stuck in that gel. It makes a beautiful base to, uh, to do microscope work and to really characterize what those particles look like right when they fell. Um, this, what I'm gonna show you here is a movie collected from a time-lapse camera that's looking up through the bottom of the gel on the sediment trap tube. So we saw the starburst wrapper that was just focusing the camera in the lab. And now the trap has been deployed. Um, this one is from exports. It's actually at a depth of 95 meters, which is just at the base of where the sunlight was penetrating. So you can see the difference between day and night in this time-lapse video. It's going forward in time pretty quick. Now it's daytime again. Um, and when it gets dark, we'll be able to see better the particles again. But you can see the particles raining down and mostly getting stuck in this gel. They kind of drift around in the gel a little bit. Um, but this time-lapse video gives us a sense of the time period, uh, or the, the, the time variability, I guess, of the particles sinking in. Um, so I'm going to go into a little more detail about what those things actually are in the next slide. Okay. 
So once the gels are collected, uh, we, we take careful microscope images of them. Um, and so I'm gonna walk through some of the types of things that are seen here. So the time-lapse video I was showing you was actually close. If you're looking at a laptop screen like me, it's actually just a little bit bigger than real life. Um, these microscope images obviously are much more magnified. Um, so in the gels, we see a lot of different kinds of particles. Um, these are um, single cells. These are actually individual organisms that we found sinking into the traps. Uh, so in the blue box are protists uh, called rhizaria. So they're sort of like single celled animals and they build these beautiful silicate, um, frust not frustules, but they're, they're kind of like that. They're these cages around them. So that's what you're seeing here. Um, and then phytoplankton themselves. So the, like the falling leaves, right? The phytoplankton that are sinking down as single celled um, by themselves into the, the traps. Um, and you can see these are, the scale bar is different here than here. So these guys are much smaller, the phytoplankton. Um, we also see aggregates. So these are particles that are um, the dust bunnies, right? Things that are stuck together. Um, often phytoplankton will contribute to those. So they'll stick together and then they'll sink faster once they're in a larger aggregate. We also see lots of different kinds of zooplankton poop. So these are fecal pellets. Um, they come in in lots of different types. They've been categorized here on the basis of their size or their aspect ratio. Um, but we can actually, with expert input, connect these back to who actually produced them. There are people who can tell you that. Um, I'm not one of them, but it's important information. Um, so uh, I'd like to point out just the, the salp fecal pellets here are quite large. So when you do co collect those, they're actually really important. Um, salps are kind of like gelatinous vacuum cleaners. They, they're they can be different sizes, but the ones that we were seeing out there were a few centimeters in size and they basically just suck up everything. And then when they produce a fecal pellet, it sinks very quickly. Um, there's also things like short fecal pellets, which are thought to be just chunks of the, the large and long ones as they fall apart. And then finally, uh, we do see what we call detritus. This is just it's not clearly an aggregate. It might be degraded fecal matter. We're not really sure. Things start to kind of look um, very unidentifiable over time uh, as, they, as they degrade out in the ocean. But so these are just categories of particles that, uh, that we classify the images we see in the gel trap into. Um, and this is all work that's been spearheaded by my colleague, uh, Colleen Durkin of Moss Landing. She takes these beautiful microscope images for this. Okay, so with all of these particle types, we can actually model how much carbon is sinking out of the ocean at different depths um, on the basis of which kind of, of particle it is. So we can see which particle type is carrying the most carbon to depth. Um, this was from our second deployment in the Exports North Pacific uh, cruise, and we called our deployment cycles epochs. I won't get into why, but uh, this is the second one. Um, and what we see is that these long pellets, so this category, seem to be responsible for most of the carbon flux it, at about 100 meters, which was just around where the light started to disappear. Uh, it's sort of the base of that, that sunlit skin of the ocean. And then they attenuated, they, they disappeared very quickly, so that by the time we got to 200 meters, very few of those sinking particles were left. And then it was just small contributions to a small sinking flux from all these other different classes. Now what I'm gonna do is show you the other two, we did three deployment cycles. So one and three are now up on the screen. Um, and the colors match the, the boxes around the different particle categories. I should have mentioned that. Hopefully you connected there. Um, so what we see is that in epochs one and three, we have this, especially in one, we have this really outsized contribution of salp fecal pellets. So it turns out they were really important for this transfer of carbon through sinking particles from the upper ocean into the midwater. Um, in all three of our epochs, we still see this contribution of long fecal pellets at this, the 100 meter shallowest trap and then they degrade really quickly and start to, to disappear by the time you get to deeper depths. Um, the takeaway from this is just that even over short 
time periods, we see a lot of variability in what organisms are contributing the most to carbon flux. And what I hope is pretty obvious to everyone is that in the North Pacific, we really see an important contribution of the higher trophic levels, right? So things that are higher up in the food web to the carbon export. Not a whole lot of aggregates, not a whole lot of phytoplankton cells, but rather these, these phyto or these um, zooplankton sinking materials seem to really contribute a lot here. So summarizing that, those zooplankton mediated processes, um, the sinking products of zooplankton and um, probably their migration as well, although I did not get into the details there, are among the most, contribu the most important contributors to the sinking carbon pool there in the summer. There's some indication that there's actually non-sinking carbon that's actually really important as well, small particles and dissolved organic matter. But uh, my colleagues and I are still teasing that out. So we hope that um, we will be able to go to the North Atlantic Ocean in 2021 in the spring, um, if, uh, if life and reality allow us to. Um, and the reason we're so excited to do that is because we need to, again, if we're, we're thinking about what will um, allow us to predict changes, uh, the effects of, of changes um, in the ocean on the biological carbon pump, we really want to get a sense as to what matters where, what processes are most important in what current environments, and then we can start to extrapolate to what that might look like in the future. For instance, if we increase the temperature that stratifies the ocean more, will that have an effect on primary production? Will that have an effect on, um, on zooplankton rates? Uh, if we acidify the ocean, will that change the role of calcifying organisms, those that build their shells out of calcium carbonate? Uh, if we increase or decrease the sea ice cover, rather, will that also have an effect specifically on the primary producers? Um, so in the, in the North Atlantic, we're hoping we're going to get this in-member um, of a site that instead of being dominated by zooplankton processes and slowly sinking material, instead we'll be looking at a place that really has a, a larger effect of physical advection and mixing and phytoplankton uh, pathways. So um, that is it. That's all the material I've got for you here. Um, I hope that uh, I've kind of connected it all together. At the end, I know we were talking about some pretty detailed uh, poop classes and things like that, but, um, but this is uh, a pretty important um, set of processes, the biological carbon pump, to figuring out how our oceans might uh, be responding and how the global carbon cycle um, might be responding to ocean processes in a changing future. So uh, thank you. I'm happy to take your questions. And I should mention, I've got a long list of acknowledgments uh, down here at the, the bottom of the screen, but the, all the data I'm showing you could not have happened without work of my collaborators and many, many vessels, uh, research vessels, their captains and crews. So, and funding from NASA. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meg. That, that was a great talk. Um, so folks, please feel free to add questions in the Q&A module at the bottom of your screen. If you just hit that, you can, you can write in questions and I will um, present them to Meg and we have, we have some time here for questions. Um, to kick things off, Meg, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the ocean's role in the global carbon cycle in terms of the open ocean versus coastal mm -hmm. environments. There's a lot of conversation now about blue carbon and the role that nearshore yeah. marine ecosystems can play in terms of um, offsetting humans' carbon emissions. Can you, can you place that in context for us in, in light of the yeah. open ocean work? So for a long time, um, we, the, the coastal environment is, as you probably are aware, a lot more complex um, in certain ways when we think about carbon. Is it a source or is it a sink? Um, what are the most important uh, environments in terms of carbon sinks and coastal, the coastal environment? So that's um, in the last, you know, 10 years or so, that's really come a long way. We have a, a much better sense now as to what coastal environments are doing. Mm -hmm. We do know that uh, coastal environments have much larger carbon fluxes overall. So productivity is higher, um, carbon burial and accumulation in the sediments is a lot higher. Um, the, the, so it's really fast rates. Uh, the difference, of course, is that coastal environments are quite 
small in terms of their area compared to the open ocean, which is huge. So when we start thinking about the global climate, right? So when I'm starting from this perspective, where does atmospheric CO2 end up and where do our emissions end up? The open ocean is where focus has often been, but in terms of what we can do and the environments that we're actually interacting with, the coastal environment is really important. And as I said, the, the rates are really high there. Thank you. That's, that's great context. There's a question here from Jeremy Rich. Uh, first, a compliment. Great talk. Uh, and Jeremy asks, how did sinking rates of POC in the North Pacific compare to primary productivity rates there? Is it a small right. drip of the leaky faucet? Indeed it is. Um, <laughs> so this is, uh, this is not unexpected, right? So work has been done in this part of the Pacific Ocean for decades, and we know that it is in general um, a low export ratio kind of place. So, and by export ratio, I mean the amount of carbon sinking relative to the amount of carbon that's being produced by that upper ocean cycling that I was talking about. Um, so based on our sediment trap measurements and one estimate of the net primary production, um, and so for folks who don't know what I'm talking about, um, this is just the amount of primary production that's not actually consumed by the phytoplankton themselves, the extra that's allowed to go into the rest of the ecosystem. The export ratio is around five to 10%. So uh, it's, pretty, it's a pretty small drip. Um, and we do expect to see a real contrast when we get out into the North Atlantic in the springtime. Um, that will be very different. Um, <clears throat> and there's still some, uh, as I said, there's, that's, that five to 10% is based on what we see in, in terms of sediment traps and, uh, and other me measurements of sinking carbon, right? So it might shift a little bit if we start to consider other sources of carbon as well. Hope that wasn't too complex of an answer for Jeremy. <laughs> Um, here's a question from, from Richard Benz from, from Concord, Ohio. Great to have you back, Richard. How much does the atmospheric carbon dioxide that is increasing impact acidification of the ocean, particularly off of the main coast? Okay, so um, atmospheric carbon dioxide, as you probably know, well, it gets into the water, it reacts with the water itself, it produces an acid, so it's increasing the acidification, it's decreasing the pH. Um, and so, uh, the, the pH globally in the global ocean and the open ocean is definitely decreasing. The long records that we have show um, that, that we've got this, this acidification process going on. And uh, the expectation is that this is happening in the Gulf of Maine as well. Um, and so this could be, particularly when you think about uh, fisheries and, and people who depend upon calcifying organisms, um, this could have a really important impact. Great. Um, and a question here from Chris Davis. How deep do particles have to sink to be considered lost to the upper mm -hmm. waters and headed for long-term storage? Right. So that's uh, an active area of conversation. But um, I would say, so traditionally, people have looked at, you know, does it, how, how likely is a sinking particle that makes it out of the surface sunlit layer um, how likely is it to make it <clears throat> 100 meters below that? So that's one metric. Um, but actually, I think uh, there's a lot of talk now, and I'm kind of on that page as well, about the base of the winter mixed layer being the important depth that, that sinking carbon needs to get to before we really consider it sequestered in the deep ocean. Because as you probably realize, uh, if you hang out in Maine uh, or any ocean area in the winter time, you can have a lot more mixing, a lot more wind. And so any carbon that makes it down, but not all the way down to where the winter mixing reaches will just get ventilated back out to the atmosphere. Um, so for instance, in the North Pacific, the data that I was showing you, um, we often will see winter mix layers that are not that deep, you know, mm -hmm. 200 meters, depending on where you are, um, there's a lot of salinity stratification there. But in the North Atlantic, uh, you might need to get that carbon, depending on where you are, down hundreds of meters or even a kilometer into the ocean before it, you would consider it sequestered. That's really, really interesting. And so that, that makes me wonder about um, some of the technological solutions that have been posed in terms of storing carbon. Um, mm -hmm. In, in, light, in light of the 
growing load that we have globally and the role that you describe the oceans can play. I realize it's a little bit outside the area that you discussed today, but can you, can you comment at all on the viability of um, some of the plans that have been proposed to engineer increased right. carbon storage in oceans in, as part of dealing with the climate challenge ahead of us, right. in front of us, I should say. So, so there's a number of different uh, geoengineering solutions that have been proposed that involve storing carbon in the oceans. But if we're specifically thinking about um, storing things on the seafloor or in the seafloor, right? Like storing carbon down there, you uh, would definitely want to see that attempted not in locations where you're likely to disturb the bottom, where the surface interacts with the bottom at any time during the year, um, where there's any sort of instability in your bottom storage area, right? Um, and so uh, definitely deep water. Um, and depending on the form that you're storing the carbon in, uh, that's gonna make a difference as well. Um, there are other uh, solutions that have been proposed that don't necessarily involve burial of carbon or storing it on the seafloor or in deep water. Um, and those, uh, there's, there's caveats with everything, I guess, so I'm not gonna dig into the details of all of them, but yeah, there are some, some solutions make sense, others maybe not as much when you start to think about the costs and the risks involved. Yeah. Great, well, thank you. Um, I know that there's a high level panel on oceans that involves technical and policy experts from around the world and that they've, they've tackled this as one of many topics. Um, so I'll uh, try to put that in the chat if people wanna follow up on it further. Um, there's a question here from Rick Wally. He, he, um, is going back to one of your first slides mm -hmm. and was surprised to see that compared to fossil fuels, land use change mm -hmm. has had a relatively constant absolute contribution to global CO2 pools over the last century. And he's surprised because we hear so much about deforestation and other terrestrial disturbances impacting the CO2 budget. Can you, can you talk a bit about that? Well, so I think it's important to just um, clarify that the, the, top, the constant line that Rick is talking about is in emissions due to land use change. And so there's also this question of um, if the land is, if we're going to, to hope that the terrestrial biosphere, uh, the terrestrial system is gonna take up, so that if you think about the bottom part of that graph, right, the amount of carbon going into the land, that also depends on things like deforestation and terrestrial disturbances, right? So so there's the, the part of the carbon release to the atmosphere that has to do with uh, just changing land use, right? Um, and then also it has to do with, do, do we now not have those forests to take up the carbon? So it's the, the land systems are important both on the emission and the uptake side of, of the balance. Um, so I think that's that maybe is part of, of the answer to your question. Um, the other thing I would say is that I have not chased down every single one of the data references in the data publication that's used to summarize this, this global emissions and uptake balance. Um, so if we dug around in that, I think we might also be able to, to look a little closer and figure out, like, is it really true that land use change, carbon release has been pretty constant? Um, complicated question for sure. Um, one final question here from Paloma Henriquez, uh, an incoming SMS graduate student. Uh, she enjoyed your talk and is curious to learn more about the research vessels that you were on. Mm -hmm. Can you describe what size they were, what it was like to be uh, aboard yeah. for the weeks and weeks? Um, okay, so these are all, all the research vessels that I'm talking about or that I, um, I'm looking at my, my acknowledgement list here. The, the ones that I was showing pictures and data from are all what we call, um, most of them anyway, are global or ocean class vessels. So they're quite large. These are, um, some of them are like 200 feet in length, right? So they're, they're much bigger than maybe some of the, the boats you would see working around the coast of Maine. Um, they're not as big as like a cruise ship or anything like that. They're kind of the size of a, a large ferry. Um, is maybe the right thing. Or if you um, if you wanted to take Obear Hall up in Orono on the campus and launch it to sea with all the oceanographers that work in Obear Hall on board, it would kind of be about that scale. Um, so going to sea on those vessels is typically 
um, you would only take a ship like that if you needed to be out for weeks uh, up to a month um, or sometimes a little bit longer. Um, so these are, are for long-term cruises where you really need to be self-supporting at sea for a long time. Um, and uh, yeah, there's usually, for a global class vessel, there's usually 60 people on board. About half of them are actually crew, so they're responsible for the upkeep and running the vessel and cooking the food and doing all this really important work that it takes. Uh, and then the other half of the people are usually scientists. Um, sometimes outreach people, journalists will come aboard as well. Um, and it's, it is a, it's tight quarters. Um, people who go to sea a lot kind of develop skills at figuring out how to, how to live uh, in that way for um, a month. Um, but it, it's also beautiful and it's a, a place you'll never see any other way. So it's really cool. Sounds, sounds pretty amazing. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time to share uh, a glimpse into not only ocean science, but the process of doing ocean science with all of us. It, it was really great to have you uh, present today. And I didn't read all the compliments you have in the chat, but I'll be sure to pass them on along with a, a couple more additional specific questions for you that I'm sure folks will enjoy um, hearing you follow up on later on. Uh, okay. I'll close by thanking you with a proper <laughs> clapping so that you can't hear all the other claps. Um, and also just want to let people know that we'll have the third and final session of this virtual seminar series on uh, Friday, August 7th at 10.30 a.m. You can register at the Darling Marine Center website. And I will be talking about climate science and action focused on Maine and Maine's coastal communities. So that's where we've started at the coast. We've gone to the sea, deep sea, thanks to Meg, and we'll go back to the coast in the final session of this summer's seminar series. With that, I hope everyone has a good day. Thank you again, Meg, and take care.